Welcome everyone, it's Monday once again, and that means another episode of the Wine Science Commentary. My name is Lawrence, and as always, I've prepared a highly interesting topic for you. Wine filtration, does it affect wine quality, yes or no? We will find out. And of course, if you like the content, then hit the subscribe button down below. That's it from my side, let's get started. Membrane Filtration Effects on Aromatic and Phenolic Quality of Cabernet Sauvignon Wines published in 2005 in the Journal of Food Engineering Head Research here was Che Piariagada Carazzana from the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and unfortunately I didn't find any further information about the authors that means we're gonna jump right to the introduction Here they state that wine filtration has always been a controversial subject especially in relation to the effect it has on wine, quali and wine quality, of course, and the literature is very small in this field. Um, I tried to find a couple of other publications on this topic, but you don't find anything. You find some older publications, mainly in French language, so I cannot present those here. And then they say that there are opinions both against or in favor of filtration, although you always read that filtration harms the wine, but clearly there is very little evidence supporting this idea, so that's why it's interesting for us to look at this paper. Material and methods. It's actually quite uh, easy to understand how they executed this research here. They took basically a wine, Cabernet Sauvignon wine, which came from Vina San Pedro in Chile, and then they filtered this wine. Um, via membrane filtration. They did three replicates, obviously because of statistical reasons, and then they basically compared the unfiltered wine to the filtered wine upon certain parameters. Furthermore, they state here that filtration system here they used. The system was built in stainless steel and consists of a compact unit with two cartridges in series, one for pre-filter, one for final filter respectively. So it looks a bit like this here. These are the kind of filters you see um, in front of a bottling line mostly. You have a pre-filter here and then in line the next filter is the final filter and you see you have this metal casing here and in this metal casing you have these cartridges here which are mostly made out of polypropylene fibers and in our case the pore size for the um, pre-filter was 1.2 micrometers and for the final filter it was 0.65 micrometers. So why is that important? Obviously if you want to exclude let's say Saccharomyces cerevisiae cells, then you have to use a filter that has a smaller pore size than the diameter of the Saccharomyces yeast cell itself. So you see here the pore or the, 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 the cell size of Saccharomyces is 2.5 to 10 micrometers. So obviously they got rid of, of these yeast cells completely. Also they excluded Brettanomyces because you see here it has approximately the same um, cell size as Saccharomyces. But then once you go a uh, level lower to the bacteria stage, then you see here these only have a size ranging from 0.5 to 1 micrometer for Unococcus uni, so our malolactic fermentation bacteria. And let's look at the Acetobacter size, obviously the same size as MLF bacteria, meaning for the final filter in our case, they used 0.65 micrometers of pore size. So basically they could not have been completely sure that they excluded all these bacteria. And in real life, obviously you use something that is smaller than 0.5 micrometers, mostly 0.45 micrometers. All right, um, so the filtration system is easy to understand. You have, as I said, this metal casing here. Within this metal casing, you have your cartridges. The quantity of cartridges you use depends on the filter, uh, filtering amount. So how much wine you want to filter. The wine flows in from the side. The metal casing fills up. You have to make sure that you don't have too much oxygen in here. Otherwise, the filtration doesn't work as well. And then, yeah, once, this, once you fill up this metal casing, the wine goes through the cartridges. Filtration takes place. And then the wine exits again, normally at the bottom or on the side somewhere. And flows into the next filter. So an easy system to include in front of the bottling line and then let's go back to our paper. So what kind of parameters they measured? They measured certain volatiles via GCMS over 100 in total. They also measured certain color indices, indices color intensity index. They measured also of course tannins, <coughs> anthocyanins and some other stuff. And then interestingly, they also built a sensory panel. So the sensory panel um, 
consisted of 17 panelists. These panelists were students in the last semester of Enology, so almost experts. And um, these panelists then had to tell which one was filtered, which one was not filtered, and the results we're going to look at at the end. So, first table here. Table number one shows uh, certain parameters they measured, and as I said, they uh, had three replicates, filtration one, two, and three. And for every parameter and every filtration replicate, they measured every parameter three times. IC is the so-called color intensity index, measured as the light absorbance of 420 nanometers, 520 and 620, so basically of the yellow, red and blue color. And you see here that after filtration, this um, color intensity index decreases. Okay. Then what is wine hue? Wine hue is basically measured as the quotient between 420 nanometers and 520 nanometers absorption of light. With other words, yellow color divided by red color. And the higher this value is, the more yellowish tinges you have in your wine. So in a more aged wine, you will, we will find a higher value than in a younger wine. And you see here, after filtration, this value goes down, meaning the filtration takes away some of this yellow tinges in your wine, which is obviously positive because you have a shift towards the more bright and red color. Then what about total phenol index? Total phenol index, as you see here, decreases by approximately 10%. Anthocyanins follow the same trend. They also decrease and tannins also decrease after filtration. What about gelatin index? Gelatin index basically measures the reactivity of tannins with proteins, so basically the stringency of your wine. And interesting to see here is that the gelatin index increases after filtration, means your wine gets a bit more astringent, even though you have a decrease of tannins after filtration. Very interesting. And the only thing that didn't statistically change was the HCL index, which is a measurement for ageability of the wine, meaning if you have a value between 10 and 25, that means you could further age this wine in a barrel, let's say. And you see here you have no statistically any changes, and so this value was the only unaffected one. Then, as I told you in the beginning, they also measured or analyzed over 100 different volatiles. And of these 100 different volatiles, only 12 or so changed statistically. So, for instance, 2,3-pentadiene, which is this creamy caramel scent, decreased after filtration. Then hexanol, for instance, the scent of fresh mown grass, also decreased after filtration, as you see here. Octanol is this mushroomy taste, this increased after filtration, almost doubled. Then furfural, also decreased after filtration. This is this bitter almond aroma. Butandiol gets converted straight from um, diacetyl. This is this buttery kind of aroma. This also increases after filtration. What else? Vinyl gaiacol, which is obviously the clove scent. This triples after filtration. Nor norisoprenoids, they also yeah, kind of increase drastically after filtration, fruity floral aromatics. And so you see also vanillin uh, increases after filtration. So you see that the aromatic profile of your wine changes. Some volatiles increase, others decrease. And then I told you at the beginning, they had a sensory panel which had to tell which wine was the filtered one, which one was the non-filtered wine. So they say here, the results obtained were 20 correct answers and 14 incorrect results. So 20 students were able to tell the filtered wine from the non-filtered wine and 14 couldn't. But however, according to the statistical table, this demonstrates that there's a significant sensorial differences, difference between the two wines. But just keep in head, those guys were experts and <laughs> some of them couldn't tell the difference. Then, conclusion. The results presented in this paper show that the use of membrane filtration of Cabernet Sauvignon wine affected both its aromatic and phenolic profiles, producing a decrease in the concentration of tannins, around 5%, decrease of anthocyanins, 2.5%, and an overall reduction of polyphenols of 10%. Then, although there's a loss of the color intensity index, around 2.2%, a slight positive decrease in the hue was also observed in the filtered wine. So the shift towards the red spectrum um, of 
the wine color. Regarding the aromatic compounds, a statistically significant variation was observed in 12 of the analyzed compounds, the probable cause being the same as the one mentioned earlier, and so on and so forth. So, overall you can see that filtration obviously changes the basic chemistry of your wine and the profile, the volatile profile of your wine. So now it's up to you to decide if you want to use filtration or not. So you see here that uh, a special list panel consisted of students was able to tell the difference between a filtered and non-filtered wine, although you know only 20 correct answers out of 34. So a bit more than a half could, could tell the difference between filtered and non-filtered wines. And these are, you know, highly trained people. So can the average consumer tell the difference between filtration and non-filtration uh, wines? I say no. And then obviously you don't, um, if you don't filter your wine, you still remain with all these instability problems coming from, you know, microorganisms coming from other um, yeah, compounds, which you don't exclude in your final bottling. So yeah. I would say there is a difference in non-filtered wines compared to filtered wines, but the difference is smaller than you think. That was the weekly episode of the Wine Science Commentary, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked it. If so, then subscribe to the channel. If you like the content, why not? And stay tuned for more next week when we look at a paper which compared, you know, punching down your cap to not punching down your cap at all. Are there any differences? Where are the differences? We will find out. And have an awesome week. Stay safe. Stay hydrated. See you next Monday.